I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olevsky, and I'm the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational webinar series, and I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. These webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education, and we would like to thank our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Amgen, and Novartis for supporting these webinars. And today's webinar is Vasculitis in the Skin, which I'm sure all of you know because we have so many of you here today. Dr. Galen Folk is an Associate Professor of Dermatology and Public Health Sciences at Penn State University. He is the co-director of the Penn State Rheumatology Dermatology Clinic at Penn State and has a special interest in vasculitis and related autoimmune diseases. And we're so happy to have you here with us today, Dr. Folk. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I'm very grateful you invite me. Thank you so much. And before we have you share your screen, could you tell us if you have any disclosures today? I don't have any disclosures relevant to the topic that we're discussing today, but I have served as a consultant for AstraZeneca for other autoimmune diseases. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And now, if you'd like to share your screen, we look forward to your presentation about vasculitis and the skin. All right. Let me get myself in presentation mode here. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you again for the kind invitation. I'm so excited uh, to be speaking to the Vasculitis Foundation. It's such a fun talk to give because it's one of the few talks where I really get to speak to patients who are dealing with the disease. Most of the other talks that I get to give are to physicians or other care providers. And so to be able to speak with people <clears throat> that live and experience these things is so much more fun for me. So thank you for inviting me. I hope that you find some value in the talk today. Uh, as a dermatologist, oh, I talked about my disclosures, but as a dermatologist, my goal is really to talk about vasculitis from a skin perspective. Uh, how it impacts our skin, why we see what we see. But I really want to try to answer the question that a lot of patients ask me in clinic, what is happening to my skin? Why does it look this way? Why is it involved? And we'll also touch on some other questions that could be like, is what I'm dealing with with my skin vasculitis? Uh, there are plenty of patients that deal with vasculitis and have no skin involvement at all. So I hope I'm not making it seem like this is the only type of vasculitis that's out there. It's a complex family of diseases that can affect all aspects of us as people. But we're really going to focus on that skin type today. We're going to try to answer the question, why do different types of vasculitis look different? I really am hoping to go into some nitty gritty details about what happens to lead to what we see. I'm always excited to answer questions about that. I'm going to touch on topics like what tools do doctors use to understand vasculitis and to get an idea of which type of vasculitis a patient has and how the skin can be a really clear window into which groupings of vasculitis we should be looking at. And then we're going to go over some terms that you're probably all familiar with. I find that my uh, vasculitis patients are so well educated, uh, but sometimes we speak doctor in front of you all. And I hope to break down some of those terms and make them very, very clear. I talk about all this in the context of cases, patients that came to see me in clinic, that I've seen in clinic, uh, and I'm so grateful that so many of my patients are great teachers. I'm so excited sitting in the waiting room because many of my patients are here today. I saw a lot of names from Penn State, but also very exciting. I saw a lot of names from UNC, people that I miss working with very much. So thank you very much for being here and for being willing to be teachers. Uh, so like I said, I frame everything around cases because patients teach me so much and so many of my patients are so excited uh, to teach others and to contribute knowledge to make sure that patients that come after them, that their disease is diagnosed faster, that their treatment is more successful. And I'm just so grateful to all of you for being such wonderful, wonderful educators. Uh, so a day in my clinic uh, often looks like this. I'll have a patient that comes in and they came in because another doctor told them to go ask Galen if this is vasculitis. And that is uh, often what my role is. And then, of course, to help patients do better. But so in this particular example, I have a 54-year-old man who had a, a, a cold, a URI, upper respiratory infection, rather recently. Now, this is a common abbreviation that means past medical history. Uh, his past medical history, should, you know, he, we're really just talking, he's had some high blood pressure. He's been on stable medicines for a long time. Doctors will use this term review of systems, ROS, pretty regularly. And other than his cold recently and this rash on his leg, which burns and itches, he's been feeling pretty well. 
like many patients, he comes in with a referral that says, ask Galen if this is vasculitis. And as a dermatologist, I can look at that leg and within a second or so say, absolutely, that's vasculitis. I know we're dealing with it. But how is it that some doctors can look at vasculitis and know what it is? Why, can some, why are some not able to do that? Uh, and these are some of the things that we'll talk about today. I, I can tell as a dermatologist that this patient has vasculitis, and I will show you how I can do that in just a few minutes. But I want to make it very clear that doctors from all specialties have really, really unique skill sets. And if you came to my clinic and asked me about an eye problem, I will not be able to have any idea what's going on because I have no specific training in eyes. I don't know the language of how to describe what's going on with patients and just like I know very little about eyes, there's lots of doctors that don't get much training in skin. They're extremely good at lungs. They're extremely good at the gastrointestinal system, uh, but maybe they don't have a lot of experience with skin. So they need uh, to rely on other docs like myself who have a little bit more expertise in that. So, so how do we understand when a patient has vasculitis? I spent way too much time making this drawing on the left side here. I was almost maybe procrastinating a little bit and putting the rest of the talk together. Uh, but I think it's really important for us to understand uh, what the skin looks like under a microscope and how its blood supply works, because that's really foundational to the rest of the talk. If we're looking at the skin, uh, kind of imagine like you slice a bread loaf and you slice the bread and then you look at the loaf uh, direct or the little slice of bread directly. Uh, this is the surface of our skin up here. The outer layer of our skin is called the stratum corneum. It's this waxy group of proteins that are tightly bound together. Uh, their job is to make our skin waterproof and keep germs out, keep dirt out, etc. It's a non-living layer. Under that, this pink layer I made here is called the epidermis. It's the living layer of the skin. It's composed of a bunch of cells that held to each other, look a lot like a brick wall. Under that, we have this kind of tan layer, which is the dermis. The dermis is made up of bundles of collagen, it's where most of the blood vessels that feed our skin is. You can see this branching tree represents the blood supply. An artery comes up from deep underneath the fascia, this bottom layer of brown here. It comes up just like the trunk of a tree and branches into successively smaller levels until it gets very close to the bottom layer of the epidermis. There's no blood vessels at all in the epidermis. They get all their nutrients by diffusion from these tiny little vessels underneath. So most of the branching occurs in the dermis. There's a big trunk of an artery that pierces through the layer underneath the dermis called the paniculus. Some people call this the fat, but that word can be confusing. So you'll hear me call it the paniculus. And then the layer of fascia is this tight layer, almost looks like saran wrap really, um, that separates our skin from the things underneath it, like muscle, bone, et cetera. Vasculitis is an autoimmune disease, all of us know this, where the immune system causes damage to the blood vessels. It does so through uh, many different mechanisms uh, and can affect different organs in different ways. All right. The size of the blood vessel and the location of the blood vessel that is damaged will help break vasculitis down into different disease states. Okay. And that's really important to understand. The biggest thing to take away from a skin standpoint is that the vessel gets smaller as it gets more superficial. So we talk about really three broad categories of vasculitis and they each have lots of individual ones within them, but there's small vessel vasculitis. Small vessel vasculitis is disease of the very distant tips of the trees right underneath the epidermis. There's medium vessel vasculitis, which is this trunk of the tree down here, and then there's large vessel vasculitis. There are no large vessels in the skin. So for the most part, large vessel vasculitis doesn't show up in the skin. On the rare occasions where it does, it's really gigantic ulcers. We'll have a few pictures later about that. Small vessel vasculitis is the one that we talk about the most. Uh, it gets way more discussion than the other types. And that's not necessarily fair, but that happens because it is more common than the other types. We talk about the word petechia occurring with small vessel vasculitis, which we'll talk about in just a second what that word means. Medium vessel vasculitis, which happens down lower, tends not to cause petechia, but nodules and net-like 
things and star-shaped things, which we'll show you photos of later. And then, like I said, large vessel vasculitis is really not common. So this gentleman has petechia. He has small blood-colored spots on his leg that when I push on them, they don't disappear, meaning they don't blanch. All right, so all those little flecks on his leg are petechia. Petechia can occur from a lot of different things. On the left of our screen here is another patient with vasculitis, and vasculitis patients that have small vessel vasculitis, they manifest petechia as a common symptom. But petechia can occur in a number of other disorders that aren't related to vasculitis. These other three photos look rather similar to the vasculitis patient, but these patients do not have vasculitis. This is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is uh, bacterial endocarditis. And this is something called dermatitis herpetiformis, or an allergy to gluten. Uh, petechia are red blood cells that have gotten outside of the blood vessels and are stuck in the dermis. They don't blanch because when we push on them, those blood cells are stuck here. When we have something that's red, like from psoriasis or poison ivy, which are just inflammatory, they're red because there's more blood flowing through the area. When we push on it, we can close those blood vessels down with pressure and it turns white. When we let go, it turns red again. Petechia and purpura, which are kind of synonyms, do not blanch when you push on them. Petechia can cause from anything, can come from anything that gets blood outside of a blood vessel wall. It can come from a bruise. It can come from a bleeding disorder. It can come from vasculitis. What makes the petechia of vasculitis unique are their color. They're red like blood, unlike the blues, greens, and yellows we see of a bruise. And they're what we call palpable. Palpable is a fancy doctor term that means we can feel it when we close our eyes and run our fingers over it. We can feel little bumps where the petechia are. Palpable petechia occur because there's inflammation driving the damage to the blood vessels. It's letting the red cells get out. So when you have inflammation in a tissue like skin, you get swelling. And when things swell, they take up more space. And so you can feel them when you run your fingers over it. So inflammation is a key feature of petechia that only vasculitis does. So when we have petechia that we can feel, that means it's vasculitis. And that's why I can look at that patient's leg in just a few seconds and understand what's going on. Autoimmunity is leading to damage of the tiny vessels at the tip of the tree that cause these vessels to break down and leak red blood cells into the skin causing petechia. And the inflammation causes swelling and that's how we feel it. In small vessel vasculitis, the blood vessels are injured by something called an immune complex. An immune complex is a grouping of several antibodies that are stuck to each other in a big pile. Uh, antibodies are little proteins made by our immune system. They work like little heat-seeking missiles. They float through the blood, and if they find a germ, they stick to it, and they create a process that destroys that germ. Here, these antibodies are sticking to each other, and they make these big complexes uh, and when you have a big complex in a liquid, it becomes harder to dissolve that complex. The bigger the molecule, the more complex it is, the harder it is to dissolve it in water. And as they start to pile up, they become harder and harder to dissolve until they're too big or too many and they can't dissolve anymore and they fall out of the liquid, just like when you put too much sugar in tea. I lived in North Carolina for a while. I'm from the North originally. But boy, tea in the South is very different than tea up here in Pennsylvania. So when I came down there and saw how much sugar was in there, oftentimes we'd see that there was so much sugar in it that it couldn't hold anymore and it would fall out of the liquid and drift to the bottom. It's exactly what's happening to the immune complexes. There's too many of them. They fall out of the liquid and they drift to the bottom part of the body and where they land on the blood vessel walls, they cause damage that injures and destroys them. That's what's going on under the microscope in this patient's leg. And because I understand those mechanisms, when this patient is sent to me and they ask, is this vasculitis? I can very quickly say, yes, it is. Let's start helping him. So when we have this damage at the tip of the tree, we see these, red um, these blood cells are stuck around here. When we look through the surface of the skin, we can see these little dots. Imagine if you're looking down here, you'd see little dots at the areas where this blood vessel burst open. We call this cutaneous small vessel vasculitis that small vessel vasculitis that involves the skin, and we talked about how it happened. 
Small vessel vasculitis is a family. And these are the members of the family, the diseases that can cause small vessel vasculitis. We're gonna talk about them and more, but a patient will have one of these entities, hypersensitivity, IgA type, autoimmune disease associated, urticarial, ANCA, so on and so forth. So it's our job, or my job in this case, to figure out what that is, and we work with the patient to do that. All right, and we do that by asking several questions uh, that we don't really need to go into great depth. I'm happy to answer questions about it. But when you're at a dermatologist, a skin biopsy is an important part of the workup of vasculitis. We find it very helpful for diagnosis and treatment to take a small piece of the skin and examine it under the microscope. Why do we do that? We do that for really one reason in small vessel vasculitis. We are looking for the presence of an antibody called IgA. Remember how we talked about all those antibodies bind together and make a big immune complex? There's a number of different types of antibodies. They are also like families. There's IgG, IgM, IgE. If IgA is present, then we know the diagnosis. The patient has IgA vasculitis. And it's very important to evaluate for IgA type because IgA type is much more likely to damage other organs in the body, mostly vasculitis. So really, when we biopsy a patient's skin, we should already know that the patient has vasculitis. We're trying to answer the question, which type? If IgA is present, it's going to change how we take care of the patient because it increases involvement of other organs, especially the kidney. So these patients, we're going to watch you very closely. We're going to check your urine regularly. Uh, we're looking for protein or blood in the urine, which I'm sure other webinars talk about. <clears throat> and if it's there, uh, we, we're very good at taking care. When we do a biopsy, this is what we see. This picture can be very confusing. So at the top of the screen, the top of the skin isn't visible because it's up too high. <clears throat> we're looking down in the dermis. We're deep down. And what we're seeing here is all this pink fluffy stuff, the stuff that looks like cotton candy or insulation up in your attic. That's those collagen fibers that you've heard about on beauty commercials all the time on TV. Collagen fibers give our dermis its strength. In the middle of it, we have round blood vessels. They're supposed to look like round pipes, but instead of round pipes, it looks like there's a big angry swarm of bees flying around them. These are white blood cells called neutrophils, and they are responding to that complement and doing blood vessel damage. The, the deep magenta or dark red spots, these are blood vessels, or excuse me, these are red blood cells stuck outside of the blood vessels. Those are what we would see as petechia outside of the skin. And we can see the blood vessel walls are thick and fuzzy, they're damaged. Uh, this is small vessel vasculitis under a microscope. We look for antibodies by doing a test called direct immunofluorescence. It basically makes antibodies glow under, glow in the dark. And we have different types of immunofluorescence for each of the types of antibodies. So if we, you know, if we do IgM and there's nothing, IgG and there's nothing, IgA, and then we see these green rings around the blood vessels, that would tell us that IgA vasculitis is present. So we biopsy to help understand what type of vasculitis you're dealing with. We also ask lots of questions. That's at ROS, Review of Systems, to look for any other hints for any other systemic disease. That's an important part of the workup. Uh, and once we have all the information we need, it's time to start helping. So to close this case out, a 54-year-old gentleman with a recent cold and stable medications who feels rather well other than the vasculitis, we perform the biopsy like we should, and we see that it is vasculitis, we're correct, but when we do our immunofluorescence, we see it's IgM, IgG, C3, there's no IgA. No IgA is a very good thing, that tells us, and that we do a urine analysis, patient's urine analysis was unremarkable. That tells us that this gentleman has hypersensitivity vasculitis. Hypersensitivity is one of the family members of the small vessel vasculitis family. Uh, his urine analysis stayed very normal. He did very well and recovered with minimal treatment. This hypersensitivity vasculitis is more than half of cases of vasculitis. Most hypersensitivity vasculitis, we don't know what caused it. In this gentleman, he just had a cold beforehand, very likely the cause of this. There's no way to prove that for sure, but so much vasculitis comes right after a patient had any sort of infection, something mild like a cold or something more serious like an infection of the bone. All right. Uh, less than 20% have symptoms other than their skin. 
And it's almost never a major health issue. We, you know, there's this fact floating around that 2% fatal. I think that that's very high. Uh, treatment is not always necessary for these patients. Most patients just get better on their own. We try to treat the symptoms, the itch, the burn. Most of them get better all by themselves without us doing anything. If it hangs around, we're going to think more about it. Um, this patient was a real minimalist. He didn't want to do anything if he didn't have to. Uh, so we did some uh, just plain NSAIDs. We used ibuprofen and compression. And uh, he was itchy. He wanted to try some fexofenadine, which seems to be uniquely helpful for vasculitis. That's um, fexofenadine is a generic. Uh, I actually don't know if I'm allowed to say brand name, so we're going to steer well clear of it. Uh, and we used some topical steroid creams, and he recovered very, very well. Uh, some patients, even with hypersensitivity vasculitis, it hangs around. We will use uh, systemic therapies to help out, like prednisone. But for skin isolated vasculitis, we often don't even have to use immunosuppressants. Things like dapsone, a very, very old antibiotic that was invented to treat leprosy, works very well. Uh, colchicine, an old gout medication, works very well for vasculitis. They have unique side effects, uh, and they're not appropriate for all patients, but they can be extremely helpful without increasing risk for infections. You can use those two together. But we also, also will use DMARDs, medications like methotrexate, MTX, or mycophenolate, mofetil, MMF. Uh, these medicines can be very helpful for patients whose disease just doesn't want to quit. And then rituximab, uh, which I, I know several members of this group are very familiar with, is often uh, curative for these patients. All right. And here's a slightly different patient. This patient, again, has petechia. They're lumpy, they're bumpy. I can feel them. They're sent to me to ask, is this vasculitis? Just by looking, we can see that these are very palpable. Some vasculitis is so vibrant as to give blisters, which we will call bullae or vesicles. That's a dermatology term for different types of blisters. It's a 34-year-old man who, again, felt really quite healthy other than this vasculitis. We did the biopsy as always appropriate for small vessel vasculitis. It confirmed that we were right. It is vasculitis. When we did our immunofluorescence, this patient did have IgA. IgA increases the risk for involvement of other organs. So at baseline, we checked this patient's urine. It's fine at baseline. But because that IgA is present, we know we have to keep checking it regularly. So we checked it weekly. And at week five, he developed features consistent with kidney involvement. We conferred with nephrology. And we were able to get this patient on a, a treatment that managed both the kidney and the skin successfully. And the patient did very well, resolving within a few weeks. So IgA vasculitis increases our concern for other organs. It's still very treatable. Right, this is another photograph. I'm going to take a second to thank one of our attendees today for uh, giving me permission to use this photograph. We'll say that a couple times. This is small vessel vasculitis, but a very unique type. You know, this patient has these burning and itching rings on the arms. And, uh, and this is another type of small vessel vasculitis. And this is a type called urticarial vasculitis. Uh, if when we biopsy it, we will see small vessel vasculitis, but instead of blood through the skin, like we've seen with our other patients, we're seeing urticaria. <clears throat> urticaria, sometimes called hives in more general language, are usually itchy bumps that show up and last an hour or two hours, and then they go away. But in this patient, the rings, the urticaria lasted for days. They burned. They didn't itch. They burned. And that is a very serious uh, sign when we see that hanging around. So we did a biopsy. We saw the vasculitis. We saw the patient was IgA negative. And we were able to uh, use a... Yes, it, Urticarial vasculitis is usually more difficult than the other types of vasculitis. We, we worked for this for years, and we are still working on this vasculitis. We've come a long way, but vasculitis is a journey. And uh, thank you so much to Sherry. Oh, when we originally did the biopsy, uh, don't let the biopsies hang you up. This biopsy came back as sweet syndrome. They saw a lot of neutrophils. The biopsy is not an answer key. The biopsy needs to be interpreted in the context of each patient. So when we did this original biopsy, there was a lot of neutrophils. And so the original biopsy result came back sweets, but we had them look more closely and sure enough, there was some vasculitis. All right. Cool. That's urticarial vasculitis. Let's just look at some other types of small vessel vasculitis. 
Uh, this is a small vessel vasculitis that happens in newborn infants. It gives these characteristic ring-shaped spots. Uh, this is called Finkelstein's or hemorrhagic edema of infancy. It is a vasculitis that is very stormy at onset, but these little ones do really well. So again, it's not all petechia. Here's a vasculitis that has sometimes very, very subtle findings. Here we see a small petechium next to a thumbnail. Uh, this is called a bywaters lesion, and this is a type of vasculitis called rheumatoid vasculitis. This is a young woman with rheumatoid arthritis, um, and uh, we were able to detect that and help that patient out. Uh, small vessel vasculitis can sometimes be a little bit sneaky. These are petechia. They're larger. They're just not as dark as some others. But some areas, the inflammation is so significant that the skin is breaking down where there's lots of inflammation. So we often see ulcers. We saw bullae on some of our patient blisters. You can see ulcers in patients. And uh, this photo, this next photo is pretty striking. So if you're someone who is sensitive, you might want to turn away just for a few seconds. I'll tell you when it's gone. Here we go. Uh, this they can be very, very large ulcers like this patient has. There's a type of vasculitis called erythema elevatum diutinum, uh, a very, very rare, uncommon vas uh, vasculitis. But there are lots of types of small vessel vasculitis. My favorite one is golfer's vasculitis, which is now called Disney's vasculitis, which the Disney company does not like very much. Uh, but this is sometimes in patients that suddenly get a lot of cardiovascular exercise, such as walking around the big ring at Epcot Center or something like that, they'll develop vasculitis the next day. A harmless vasculitis, uh, but has a funny name. So we like talking about it. All right, so we talked about petechia being injury to the smallest vessels and how the small vessel damage causes a red cell leak. And because they're bumpy, we know it's vasculitis. Uh, we talked about how these vasculitis can be a warning sign that we have to look at other organs, especially if IgA is present. But let's look at a slightly different type of vasculitis. What happens if instead of being right at the top of the tree, we start to get deeper down the tree? This is a, um, a patient who presented, they do have petechia, but they're a little bit larger. And the petechia tend to show up on these red welts like that. And instead of being on the feet and ankles, where those immune complexes drift down to the bottom of the body like too much sugar and sweet tea, this patient has petechia, palpable petechia, on his elbows. Also has them on the fingers. Again, there's a petechium, but it's on this kind of larger swollen bump. It's in a strange place. This patient also has really vibrant arthritis. His ankle is so swollen that we can see redness and puffiness through the surface of the skin. This is not damage to the skin, it's intense swelling of the ankle underneath it. Again, we can see these petechia on the toes. These are strange places for petechia to happen. And uh, it's important to remember that petechia is not a disease only of adults. This is a 15 year old who had had for a few weeks fever and cough. And then for the last three days, he's had this rash on the elbows. And while he's waiting for his doctor's appointment to come up to go see his pediatrician, his mom noticed this morning he's obtunded, which is a fancy medical term for he's difficult to keep awake. He's not really with it. He's pretty sluggish. He's not focused. He's falling asleep. And then he had several nosebleeds over the overnight. He doesn't have any other medical history, HX, if you see it in the note, that's our way of saying history. His review of systems, he's got a high fever. He's had it for a couple days. He's got big swollen joints that are very stiff and painful. He's very lethargic, tired, sluggish. He has a nosebleed while we're in there and he's coughing regularly. This is concerning. So it's a patient that has features of vasculitis and it seems like this might be a systemic vasculitis. We were just talking about small vessel vasculitis that were just in the skin. Now we've got evidence of perhaps some inflammation in other important organs. We do a biopsy in this patient, and biopsy interpretation is, is an art. We did two biopsies, one from the elbow and one from the foot. The foot shows small vessel vasculitis. That's what LCV means. But we got this word, palisaded neutrophilic granulomatous dermatitis in the elbow. And as someone who deals with vasculitis a lot, I know that this is just a description. And when we have vasculitis and granulomas together, I'm really concerned about the presence of something called ANCA-associated vasculitis, which I'm sure this group is very familiar with, but a family of uh, very significant systemic 
vasculitis. The DIF was negative. There was no IgA. But uh, the urine does show uh, blood, hemoglobin, and protein. HB means hemoglobin. All right, so with a review of systems and positive UA, uh, when we have uh, signs of the patient being on the sicker side, we need to do an extensive workup. Uh, and when we do it in this patient, we find that this patient does have antibodies called ANCAs, anti-neutrophilic excuse me, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, specifically one called PR3 positive. And so this is indicative of ANCA-associated vasculitis. This patient has granulomatosis with polyangiitis or granul granulomatous polyangiitis. And a third of these patients have skin findings. Not even close to everybody does, but a third of them. It can affect the skin in a lot of ways, but it has a unique fingerprint. It tends to affect deeper down in the blood vessels, and I'll show you what we mean by that. What makes GPA even more interesting, the ANCA-associated vasculitis can have direct vasculitis in skin, but the autoimmunity can lead to other skin disorders that are really unique and striking. So under the microscope, we start to see these large globs of white blood cells and degenerating collagen called granulomas. Granulomas are something the body uses to wall off something that's very dangerous. Like if you get a splinter of glass or certain infections your body can't kill, it'll make granulomas. They also can show up in autoimmune disease. All right, so instead of just petechia, this patient had larger papules. Papules is a medical term that means a bigger bump, something that's kind of in the half centimeter to centimeter range something pretty large. Um, he's got some star shapes to his petechia. They're not smooth. They have lots of little spiky, jagged edges sticking off of the edge of them. So we're starting to see these kind of almost star-shaped things. We do have to use our dermata imagination a little bit when we start talking about shapes. Dermatologists look for very key terms. Sometimes we can even see other things like what we call lividoid or net-like changes. All right, these are changes that occur deeper down in the vessel tree. Instead of being just at the top, like we saw with our other types of small vessel vasculitis, ANCAs occur a little bit deeper down in the branching. We're not down here in the medium vessel yet, but we're definitely deeper than the last type. And as such, we start to see bigger areas that are affected. We start to see them mixed with small things. And we might even start to see areas of necrosis. If we knock out enough blood vessel, this whole area might not get enough blood and start to break down on the surface. And when these things all stack up on each other and we look at them from the top, they get spiky or stellate or star-shaped. And that's something that ANCA vasculitis does a little bit more. We can also start to see net-like or lividoid things where we have areas in the middle of the chain links where you have good healthy vessels, and then you have some unhealthy vessels in, in between the areas that they share, leading to this kind of dusky purple color. So here's another patient with ANCA vasculitis. We're starting to see some necrosis. We're starting to see some spiky star-shaped things. They kind of stack up on each other. Uh, again, spiky star-shaped changes. Um, again, they can be pretty significant. This patient doesn't have petechia, this patient doesn't have breakdown, but you start to see these purple net-like changes over the knee. These are lividoid changes. You can also have really unique changes like involvement of the conjunctiva, the clear part of the eye that's uh, over the whites. You can have involvement of the nasal lining that can even cause ulcers to come through on the skin on the outside. Or really, really big net-like changes called levito racemosa. All right, patients with ANCA vasculitis and many types of vasculitis are often on a journey where they're having trouble getting diagnosed, their, their skin is changing over time. It's not, uh, it's not always the same thing. You can have ulcers at one point and net-like things at another point, all right? This ANCA pa uh, patient um, has, some, again, striking photo coming up here pretty soon if you are sensitive to that. This ANCA patient had some star-shaped and lividoid things and it took a long time to make her to get her diagnosis, and she did have GPA. But she had other autoimmune phenomena of the skin that really were center stage. She had a here's the intense photo. She had a condition called pyoderma gangrenosum, an intense autoimmune damage to the skin that causes skin ulceration. With good treatment, we were able to get that closed. She had involvement of her eye called nodular keratitis, a very very painful. Um, 
vasculitis of the eye that we were able to get under control. Uh, but it can affect in a lot of other ways. GPA can affect the gums. Uh, there are other types of anchovasculitis. We'll see some pictures of, I showed some pictures of MPA. I forgot to call them out. This is eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis eGPA. It looks a lot, again, like urticarial vasculitis, but the biopsy showed eosinophilic granulomas. Patients sometimes get a lot of mouth sores with vasculitis. But the key takeaway there is anchor associated vasculitis starts to come deeper down that tree. So we get bigger things, we get star-shaped things, we get net-shaped things, can be very impressive. So what happens if we go even further down the tree? What if we're all the way down here at the fascia and the pediculus? In these patients, we don't tend to really see any sort of petechia. Instead, what patients tend to have is very difficult to photograph, but tender nodules. So this patient has a sore nodule under her skin that feels like a marble. And when we run our fingers over it, she says it feels like a bruise. She has them on her legs, she has them on her thighs. Now it's a 12 year old who's had three weeks of fever and joint pain, she's losing weight. 12 year olds, we don't wanna see them lose weight at all. Uh, she's healthy otherwise, but with that weight loss and fever, we're worried about her. However, there's no petechia here. So even though we're doing a skin biopsy, we don't need to do uh, immunofluorescence, all right? So we do a special biopsy. We have a nodule. We know this is going to be deep down, so we do a special type of biopsy, either called a telescoping biopsy, where we do a big biopsy to get the top layer of skin out of the way, and then a smaller one down the middle of that, or sometimes we'll even do a surgery with scalpel under local anesthesia to get down deep. Uh, but this patient has involvement all the way down here at the bottom. That's why we feel that very deep nodule. And in bad cases, if we have bad vasculitis, it can totally knock out everything in that whole tree and lead to really significant changes, usually ulcers, if we're going to get to the skin with these ulcers. Ulcers are going to take on very large star-shaped things or net-like things. So the deeper we go down, the more likely we are to get star-shaped star things and net-like things, and the more significant they tend to be. All right, so this patient had cutaneous-only polyarteritis nodosa, a very interesting and uncommon condition, which may we are learning may have some genetic underpinning. Very interestingly, these patients do usually require immunosuppressants, along with our ANCA patients, uh, to get them doing well. Uh, this patient also had uh, mouth sores. We see an awful lot of oral ulcerations with PAN for some reason, another child with PAN. Uh, but uh, PAN can happen in any age group. I again want to thank another one of my patients who very graciously provided this photograph for us. Uh, this is PAN is very, very difficult to photograph, but this photograph is so helpful to illustrate. We can see the lividoid changes on the leg here, these very subtle net or ring light changes, but we can also see uh, dark marks where she had nodules that are slowly healing. Uh, sometimes when we have a lot of inflammation in the skin, the skin tries to darken to protect itself. And that's what we're seeing here, this post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Thank you so much to our wonderful patients that teach us so much. Again, if we're going to get ulcers in PAN, they tend to be very big. They tend to have very clear star-shaped edges or they can affect larger surfaces of the body like the ear. Okay. Large vessel vasculitis, we don't see much in dermatology. Here's a couple photos. This is a gentleman with giant cell arteritis, knocking out the temporal artery that feeds the scalp, and the areas of the scalp can break down on both sides in very, very large, extremely painful ulcers. Very uncommon. Uh, in giant cell arteritis, we can sometimes get involvement of the vessels that feed the tongue. Uh, this patient's tongue is white because there is very poor blood flow to the tongue. Sometimes we get tongue ulcers from giant cell arteritis as well. Okay, now we talk a lot about petechia and nodules and star-shaped things, but it's important to remember that not everything that's petechia and star-shaped is vasculitis. This patient was sent to me for, is this vasculitis? And we were able to say no. This patient has lividoid vasculopathy, an autoimmune disease that causes clotting in the blood vessels. And a lot of patients with vasculitis they may even go through a period where someone is trying to figure out, is it lividoid vasculopathy? Is it vasculitis? It's not always easy to tell the difference. This patient 
Again, look, we see petechia, we see they have star shapes to them. This patient has protein C deficiency, leading to abnormal clotting, not vasculitis. Another picture of lividoid vasculopathy. Uh, one of its hallmarks is this very strikingly white star-shaped scar called atrophy blanche. And just some more lividoid vasculopathy. This is another patient that was sent to me. Is this vasculitis? And we were able to say no. We have lots of petechia here, but they're really kind of bright yellowy orange. There's a lot of yellow in there. In dermatology, we call this cayenne pepper yellow. I have never seen cayenne pepper in my life, but I know what this color looks like. So if I ever do run into cayenne, I'm sure I'll recognize it. Uh, but this color is very specific for pigmented purpura, which is not vasculitis. It's another condition that's commonly mistaken for vasculitis. These brown net-like areas uh, are called, uh, well, this is from a heating blanket. This is called erythema ab igni. Now be careful with your heating blankets. They feel good, but if you leave them on too long, they can cause damage to blood vessels, leaving this brown pigmentation behind, mm -hmm. often mistaken for vasculitis. Another thing mistaken for vasculitis is called herniosis, purple color of their toes, also called chillblains, uh, not vasculitis. This is a separate entity. This is another condition. There's another patient with pernio that's very, very, very serious, uh, but again, not vasculitis and some others that can be confused but are not, but we'll move through. It's also really important to note, and I thank you to the contributor of this photograph. We're very grateful for you letting us share it. Patients with vasculitis can get things that everybody with skin gets. You know, this is poison ivy, and this patient very thoughtfully asked, I just want to make sure this isn't vasculitis, and I can't stress enough, we as doctors are never frustrated when we get to give you good news. So, it's never the wrong thing to ask your doctor if the thing that's going on with your skin is related to your vasculitis. It's always the right thing to do. This poison ivy, and poison ivy is a lot easier to treat. There's another patient of mine with vasculitis that was that called in. She was wanted to make sure she didn't have a flare, and I'm so excited when the patients call because we want to get them in. We want to get a look, and this is just plain old athlete's foot. Actually, this patient had gone to their primary care doctor first, and their primary care doctor said, nope, go to your vasculitis doctor. And, and have them find out. It was just athlete's foot. We used athlete's foot cream and it got all the way better. So, you know, we talk about skin and how important it is to manage the skin and take care of the skin, but we also have to remember vasculitis patients can get anything that people with skin can get. And we have to keep our mind open and we can't always be quick to blame vasculitis on the skin. So in summary, vasculitis is an autoimmune set of conditions that can cause all sorts of changes, but the way they affect the skin is really, really tied to what area of the blood vessel is being affected by the vasculitis. When the vasculitis is way up at the top of the tree, we see petechia, and that's, excuse me, small vessel vasculitis. Traditional small vessel vasculitis, the most common is hypersensitivity. It comes after infection or an allergy to a medicine, or half the time we have no idea where it comes from. That's way up at the top of the tree. ANC-associated vasculitis is a small vessel vasculitis that's a little bit lower down. Still a small vessel vasculitis, but its features start to change, to start to take on some of the characteristics that we'll see in more medium vessels. When we get all the way down here, we see a lot more star-shaped things, we see a lot more nodules, we see a lot more net-like things. So small, small plus, and medium. And in the large vessel vasculitis usually don't involve the skin, but when they do, they're very, very striking large areas of involvement. Of course, it's impossible to cover every aspect of the way that vasculitis impacts the skin, uh, but I just wanted to give a great overview. I also wanted to save time because I understand there'll be some great questions, um, but I'm happy to talk about anything. Uh, I am supported by grants that help me with my research, so I just want to express my gratitude to the Dermatology Foundation um, that supports my research and clinical endeavors. So I look forward to questions, and I cannot thank the foundation enough, the Vasculitis Foundation, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Folk. That was, uh, I learned so much. Um, you can stop sharing your screen now so that we can see your face and ask your questions. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so now it is time for people to ask questions. Please make sure that your questions are specific to today's topic. As a reminder, Dr. Folk cannot comment on your personal medical questions or medication that should be given to you because he's not actually your doctor, but he will do his best job to give you resources in his answers. 
Um, we have a lot of questions, and I did want to tell everybody, if we don't get to your questions, we have already asked Dr. Folk, because we knew there were a lot of you in the webinar today watching us, if he would do a follow-up and answer these questions, and he said that he would, and so we will record that and add it to this on the website. So just wanted to let you know, don't if we don't get to it, we mean to, and we will. So I'm going to start with some questions, if you're ready, Dr. Folk. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. This is my favorite part. Okay. The first one is I have GPA and it seems like every time I start tapering off high doses of prednisone, I start getting little bumps on my skin like KP, but it doesn't respond to KP treatment. Is that normal for vasculitis? And I'm guessing that means keratosis. Isn't Hilarious. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In germ language, KP, we, we got that one. Yeah. So I would say it could be a couple of things. I think it's important that you're evaluated by someone that knows skin vasculitis very well. Uh, but there is a version of KP called inflammatory keratosis pylorus. Uh, and inflammatory ker keratosis pylorus is red and spiky, and it can be pretty sore. Uh, but prednisone would calm down the inflammatory component of it, taking it from red to white, and then that would just come back again when the steroid went away. Mm -hmm. So that would be a possibility. It's really important, really important to make sure that that's not cutaneous vasculitis. So I encourage you to see someone that's really familiar with skin vasculitis and just rule that out. Um, even if your systemic vasculitis is under control, you can still get skin stuff, um, but there are treatments we can use that won't mess with your wonderful systemic control if you have it and still improve any residual skin features. Great advice, we appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase this one a little bit. I just, cause I just want to let others know that we don't want to ask Dr. Folk about vasculitis and COVID today because we'll tackle that in another webinar, but we will ask him about how COVID could affect the skin. So if you want it, that was a question. So I just paraphrased it to be proper for today. So if you want to comment on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, vasc uh, COVID is a a unique virus in its ability to stimulate certain arms of the immune system. It is unlike, you know, every new virus that comes along, you'll know, have some new stuff with it. But COVID in particular was uniquely stimulatory to a part of the immune system that orbits around a cytokine. A cytokine is like a hormone your immune system uses to talk to itself. A cytokine called type one interferons. Type one interferons are really important in the formation of certain autoimmune diseases, vasculitis included. And so uh, it's, you know, we have seen vasculitis from COVID. It also stimulates parts of the immune system related to um, the clotting cascade. So we have seen lots of changes in the skin from blood clots in the skin, poor blood flow to the skin. Uh, there's this condition called COVID toes, which is a type of perniosis. I don't know if you remember, I shared those purple toes and uh, described it as a mimicker of uh, vasculitis. We saw a lot of that during the COVID pandemic, and we still see a lot more of it than we used to. There's research questioning whether that relationship is real, but boy, I, I sure think that it was. Um, but because, because COVID is so good at stimulating the immune system uh, in dermatology, we have a little joke that COVID can cause dermatology. Um, it's really good at making rashes worse or teaching your body to have rashes that it didn't have before. So uh, a, a very, very large spectrum. I have patients that develop lupus a few days after getting COVID, so systemic sclerosis, all sorts of really, really... Uh, Im impressive skin-directed autoimmunity. Okay, well, thank you for that answer. That <laughs> Hopefully that answered it for the person that was asking. Um, the next question is, if prednisone, and they said in my case, 40 milligrams, is not solving a purple foot symptom, LCV, what progression of other treatments do you recommend for skin symptoms, especially that are worsened by heat movement? Yeah, so it's hard to, like Kathy mentioned, we, it's difficult to comment on an individual case, but in a general sense, uh, it is, we, I, by the nature of being a, a referral autoimmune dermatologist, I get an awful lot of patients that, with vasculitis that aren't responding to the normal stuff that's supposed to work. And so when we have a patient that prednisone isn't making a symptom of their vasculitis better, we have a lot of tools to improve it. If we think the patient has if these changes are directly related to the vasculitis, for example. Uh, we would start talking about Dapsone or Colchicine. We would start talking about what topicals could we use. Um, we have uh, a little more experience using some more advanced immunosuppressants that maybe aren't first line. So sometimes 
we've had patients with like cutaneous only polyarteritis nodosa that they didn't respond to prednisone and methotrexate and mycophenolate and hydroxychloroquine. They've been through all these treatments, rituximab, they're not getting better. Uh, we used uh, recently a, a, a new medicine for rheumatoid arthritis called tofacetinib. We were able to get good clearance. But we also have to keep in mind that systemic vasculitis can, can be related with autoimmune features in the skin uh, that aren't the vasculitis itself. It's just a broader symptom of an immune system that's no longer following the rules. I showed a patient that had pyoderma gangrenosum. I actually saw someone in the chat say they also have PG, pyoderma gangrenosum. So we would also want to make sure that it's not another, what we call parallel phenomenon or other autoimmune condition that runs in the same pack as vasculitis and likes to show up at the same time. We would treat those slightly different. You know, we could use, uh, we, we would alter our approach to make sure that we're incorporating care of that phenomenon too. The first step is to make sure that it is related to your vasculitis. Okay, thank you. Um, how about our collagen supplements helpful to repair our skin after a flare-up with skin involvement? Oh, that's a great question. They don't hurt. They won't hurt. There's no evidence to suggest that they help. I've had a number of patients take them. They, they don't seem to do much. A good, healthy diet, making sure you're active, stopping smoking if you do smoke, great control of your blood sugar if you have diabetes, great control of your blood pressure if you have hypertension. These are the best ways to repair your skin. If you have an ulcer on your lower legs uh, and you have good arterial blood flow, compression stockings, elevation can also speed up that wound healing. Uh, another important part of ulcer management is making sure that that ulcer stays nice and damp. We like petroleum jelly in dermatology. It is the best stuff for wounds. It helps them heal. Uh, so those are some general advice about wound healing. Collagen supplements aren't shown to add anything particularly. Interesting. Okay, thank you. For IgA vasculitis, what is the criteria for identifying a UA issue? Is there a threshold for protein? There is a threshold for protein. And very luckily, I got to work with Dr. Falk at UNC who taught, and his team who taught me a lot about kidneys. I'm very grateful for their education. Um, that threshold exists on a scale. You know, you're not supposed to have much blood or protein in your urine at all. So if we're evaluating your blood and protein and you're a vasculitis patient, we're seeing those things in there. Uh, there's a number of factors we consider. It's not exactly black and white. But if you have red blood cells that are what we call dysmorphic, meaning they look like they've been beat up a little bit, they're not nice and round. If you have uh, clumps of red blood cells together in a shape called a cast or cast of protein, uh, or certainly if you're excreting more than, um, you know, if your protein creatinine ratio is uh, approaching the equivalent of a gram of protein being excreted per day, that's, that's where we really start getting focused on it. But uh, protein is not supposed to be there. If we, if we get a protein creatinine ratio that's a little bit elevated and it's going to mean different things at different places, uh, but usually if I'm seeing an elevated protein creatinine ratio and protein in the urine, I'm at least going to talk to the nephrologist in my multidisciplinary clinic. And luckily it's very easy for me to just text them and say, what do you think of this number? Um, but certainly if we see a, um, a gram of protein, we need to act. Okay, thank you. Have you seen an increase of, actually, we actually answered that one. So let me move down. Treatment for, oh, this is the one I didn't know what it meant. Treatment for PNGD. Ah, yes. Palisading neutrophilic granulomatous dermatitis, PNGD. That yeah. one. Yeah, P PNGD, yes. Uh, actually, it's very, very strikingly similar to the treatment of vasculitis. Uh, a lot of times with PNGD, we, if it's isolated, we can use topicals or injected steroids to improve that. But hydroxychloroquine, dapsone, and colchicine work really, really well. The antibiotic doxycycline, works really, really well, not because we're killing any germs, but doxycycline makes it very difficult for the components of the granulomas to make it to the skin to build them. Uh, so those are all very effective treatments. I, I personally like hydroxychloroquine and doxycycline to start, but I would use colchicine and dapsone, and usually we have really great responses with that. If not, there are other options that work really well. Some of them are not great in certain types of vasculitis, the tumor necrosis and factor and the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. These are injectable psoriasis treatments work really well for PNGD, but really should not be used in certain types of vasculitis. Okay. 
Hopefully that's the answer that she needed. That was a fun question. I don't usually get asked that. That's great. And now let's see if I can say this right. Capillaritis, urticarial vasculitis, and dermatitis coexist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything, yeah, these things can exist in a spectrum. When you have an autoimmune disease, the, auto, the immune system is not following the rules. I mean, the immune system's proper function requires this intense network of really intricate and nuanced checks and balances to be operating at perfect capacity. And when we have autoimmunity, there's a whole part of that network that's not doing its job and not doing, doing it right. And we can see things start to fall apart elsewhere. It can be like a house of cards. You knock out one pillar, you can have problems in an entire different axis of the immune system. So when you have an autoimmune disease, you are much more likely to get dermatitis. You are much more likely to get psoriasis. Um, it, you can see all of these things in a dynamic equilibrium. They can come and go. Yes, I have seen every combination of those concepts you just mentioned. Okay, and we've had a couple of questions related to vaccines, so I'm just going to combine them sure. and see if you want to comment on this. This one person said, my IgA and leukoclastic vasculitis appear to be an obvious reaction to getting the flu vaccine along with the COVID vaccine. And there was somebody else that said something about the COVID vaccines. Have you, have any of your patients had vasculitis reactions to vaccines? Uh, the short answer is yes, but it's a, this requires a more thoughtful answer. We, we know that autoimmunity seems to require a genetic predisposition and some trigger to set it off. It's really interesting. If you look at identical twins, two people that from a DNA standpoint are the same person, you look at an autoimmune disease like lupus, maybe only a third of the time one of them has lupus will the other have it as well. Some diseases are more, some diseases are less. Uh, and so there clearly is something else besides the, gene besides the genes needed to trigger the autoimmunity. We think that most of those triggers are infections, viruses in particular, but there are clear incidences, and I have patients that they received a vaccine, whether it's flu, shingles, whatever, and they develop autoimmunity in short form thereafter. Was it the cause? There's no way to know that for sure, but I will say that when I look at the number of patients that got that developed autoimmunity following the flu versus the number that developed it following flu shots, it seems that the natural infection we're trying to protect people from are way more effective at being that trigger to kick off autoimmunity than the vaccine for. It happens uh, for sure. But the number of lives saved by these vaccines, the number of illnesses prevented by them far outweigh the small number of people that developed reactions or developed disease as a result of the vaccine. So in short, what I'm trying to say is it happens. And I hate it when someone has an autoimmune disease as a result of trying to do the right thing. But the vast majority of people that get these vaccines, it, it's helpful and it's protective. So the risks outweigh the benefits. I think for individual people, if they've had a reaction, they need to talk to their doctors about whether follow-up vaccines or uh, compl you know, completing whatever series you're working on is safe. Sometimes the answer is no, sometimes the answer is yes. Uh, but we, we have to keep in mind that yes, these things can occur after a vaccine, but vaccines have such an important role in maintaining the health of our population and our society at the same time. Well, thanks for that answer. I know that's a hard one to do hard one to answer. Um, can we squeeze five more minutes out of you? We're at our end. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, this is, again, this is way more fun than anything I have planned for the night. So. Okay, great. I'm sure everybody else agrees. <laughs> um, this next person said, I've been diagnosed with giant cell arthritis. Is this considered vasculitis? And have I have many of these things all over my body, including around my lips, mouth, that appear to be similar to many of your pictures today? Giant cell arteritis is absolutely a type of vasculitis. It is specifically a large cell, or excuse me, large vessel vasculitis. Um, it rarely has skin findings, but it certainly can. And when they do happen, they're usually very, very, very large ulcers. Giant cell arteritis, when it has skin findings, it typically goes, it makes ulcers on the side of the head or on the tongue. Uh, I think it's super important to talk to a doctor that's really 
really comfortable with skin vasculitis and find out if what you're dealing with could be related to it. But giant cell arteritis is absolutely a vasculitis. Right. Um, thank you. And uh, I have two questions that, um, well, I'll do the first one. I, I think it's related from previous webinars we've done to something else, but it, to somebody did ask the question, can you get skin issues, I guess, in the groin area? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, small vessel vasculitis, we looked at the palpable petechia type. Um, they favor the area around the shins, the ankles, the feet, but that can come all the way up and affect the whole, affect the whole body, including the groin. Absolutely. Other types of vasculitis uh, can show up in the groin. It's uncommon for the bigger ones, but it certainly can. Um, polyarteritis nodosa uh, can affect the genitalia specifically. Um, so absolutely, there's, there are several ways that vasculitis can affect the groin. Okay, and this one is about biopsies. Um, there's several questions. I'm going to put them all together, see what we can get from you. Um, one is, can the skin be biopsied after vasculitis flare has already cleared? Hmm. How is the skin biopsy done and does it hurt? That's a great question. So uh, skin biopsy needs to be done while the disease is active in order to appropriately identify the disease and assess for the presence of IgA vasculitis if it's small vessel vasculitis. In fact, for IgA to work, that biopsy should be performed within 48 hours of that spot developing, ideally. It doesn't always work that way, but ideally. Once the inflammation has calmed down, if we do a biopsy, we'll just get skin and debris. And there's, it's not specific enough to tell us what was there before. Uh, biopsy is performed usually by injecting some numbing medicine, and it's a shot, and shots are a pinch, and then the numbing medicine is called lidocaine, and that burns a bit when it goes in. Lasts about six to ten seconds, and then it goes completely numb, and there's no more sharp after that. Uh, we often use a punch biopsy. It looks like a pencil eraser. If you just pluck the eraser out and you have that little metal ring, it's like a little cookie cutter, and we just take a little plug out of the skin. Some of us close that with stitches. Some of us close that with a little spot of foam. Uh, it takes less than, usually it takes less than five minutes, uh, and that often includes the paperwork. Um, so there's, there's pain with the pinch and the burn of the numbing, but most patients afterwards say something along the lines of, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Great. Uh, there was a third part of that question. Did I miss a part? I think, I think that was it. was uh, how do you get it? Is it painful? Mm -hmm. And then the... Um, about being during a flare or after flare. I think you got all the parts. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Um, can you speak about chronic hives? And it says in parentheses with a biopsy that shows that it's not urticarial vasculitis. And then it says with anca vasculitis. Sure. So again, uh, when you have a problem with one portion of the immune system, we can have downstream effects where there are other parts not working well also. So chronic urticaria can occur uh, in any autoimmune disease. We see that more common with lupus. We see it more common with vasculitis. Uh, it's really important to do that biopsy and make sure that it's not cutaneous urticarial vasculitis. But you can often tell them apart clinically because urticarial vasculitis hurts. Chronic urtic urticaria itches. Chronic urticaria, the individual hives, they show up, they last a few hours, and then they move somewhere else. In urticarial vasculitis, they show up and they stay there for two to three days. Uh, these are really reliable ways to tell them apart. Uh, the management is quite different. We're really, really good at treating chronic urticaria now. In fact, some of the stuff that we've talked about here can be helpful. Um, I think to go into the treatment of chronic urticaria itself is a little bit outside of the scope of this. Uh, but sometimes, again, you, Dapsone can overlap and help with the two. Uh, that can be helpful. Fexofenadine, uh, one of the over-the-counter antihistamines, can be a little bit helpful with both of those things, uh, much more so urticaria than vasculitis. Uh, but there are ways to overlap those for sure, treatment-wise. Okay, and one more. And I just want to say, so many of you did ask questions about vasculitis in general that weren't particular to skin. So I'm sorry, I skipped over those. We'll do our best to get you your answers in another way, the Vasculitis Foundation staff is great about that. But um, the, ne the next question and final question today is gonna be, um, it was about petechiae. There were quite a few questions about it. Why do petechiae happen every now and then? And the other person was asking like, uh, can it move up and down your legs or is it just like in one spot? 
Oh, such good questions. You guys, I, I love this group because you ask such high level questions. So yeah, petechia can come and go because the amount of uh, antibodies and immune complexes that your body is making minute to minute is going up and down. So one day your body might be making a lot more antibodies for some reason. And then a week later, the amount of antibodies you're making just goes down. It fluctuates up and down. We don't always know exactly why. We know there are certain clear triggers that can make your body make more antibodies. So if you get sick, for example, you get the flu. If you get the flu, the flu, as you start to fight back against it, your body is going to turn up all the activity of your immune system. It's going to turn that volume knob up to try to fight back against the flu. But it's going to turn the volume knob up on all the good things your immune system does. And it's also going to turn the volume knob up equally on all the bad things your immune system does. So if you get sick, if you're fighting a virus, um, if you're very, very stressed, that increases your immune system too. The amount of antibody inflammation, et cetera, is going to go up. Yeah, if you're healthy and not stressed and you're sleeping great and you're not around cigarette smoke and all those things, your, your antibody level may come down. So that could explain why those spots come and go. Uh, additionally, yes, they can absolutely show up in different places. You know, they might be showing up on your shins, then they're on your thigh one day. Yeah, and that can do a lot with what's your body position like. You know, sometimes we see patients in the hospital that they get vasculitis, but because the patient in the hospital has been in the bed for two weeks, their vasculitis is on their back and buttocks and the back of their thighs. It's not on their feet and ankles. Um, so vasculitis can absolutely move around and it can have a lot to do with how much activity you have, what size vessel it is, what your body position has been like, those sorts of things. Okay, thank you for that. And, and um, before we quite finish, I just wanted to tell you that there were quite a few people that said, Thank you, and they miss you at UNC. <laughs> so, so and, you, and UNC. for those for those of you that are watching, Dr. Folk was my doctor at UNC. So yes, we miss him at UNC. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for everything that you you did today. I want to um, just see if I can share my screen. Um, there we go. Um, we just want to say thank you to Dr. Galen Falk and also to the Vasculitis Foundation for providing these. Um, webinars for our patients, and then to our sponsors, of course, Amgen, Estri, Seneca, and Novartis. So thank you, Dr. Fox, so much for taking your time again with us today. You do a great job in webinars for our patients. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. I hope you all, all have a wonderful day.